Hey everyone, it's Howard Gearhauser here alongside my dad, Dr. G. In today's video, we want to give you a really great breathing protocol that you can start using right away. And this breathing protocol really helps get oxygen to your body. So this one is going to be a quick video, but this is something that you should start implementing as soon as you can. So dad, can you explain a little bit about this breathing protocol and how it's different and what we're just doing on a normal day-to-day -day basis in terms of our breathing. Well, I think one of the uh, logical fallacies that we, we have about breathing is, you know, we need to breathe deeper and we need to breathe more because obviously if you breathe more and you breathe deeper, you're going to take more air into your lungs. And if you get more air in your lungs, then it seems like, well, then you would have more oxygen get into your body. But that is not true. So the problem, if we breathe uh, deeply and we say move a lot of air through our lungs, is we tend to drop our carbon dioxide levels. So you probably know carbon dioxide is the waste gas that we exhale. So we, our metabolism, the waste products of our metabolism, and they're really not waste, they're critically important, but that's what we call them back in medical school. But the waste products from metabolism is water and CO2. So we breathe out this CO2. And uh, what's interesting, and, and this goes back to a Russian physician that kind of came up with this concept. And he's, he's gone now, he's died. Uh, but he was involved with the cosmonauts and the Soviet athletes back in Russia. And what he found, in, he was a physician, and he found that in his working with these athletes and cosmonauts, he noticed that the most high-performing athletes or the healthiest people, when he tested their blood, and he was in a hospital where they were testing blood gases and things like this all the time, and the people that were the healthiest and the fittest and the strongest had the highest CO2 levels in their blood, which to him seemed totally paradoxical. You know, CO2 is a waste product. Why would it be higher in the blood? <clears throat> so he looked into it more carefully, and what he found is the sicker a person is, the lower their CO2 was. And he eventually correlated this to overbreathing. So overbreathing has become a lifestyle that, you know, we're all stressed out. The sympathetic nervous system causes our heart to beat faster, our fight or flight system, and to breathe more. So what's been shown is that the normal breathing amounts, like the amount of air you'd breathe in a minute, is called the minute ventilation. The minute ventilation has gone up over the years. If you look at old textbooks, the minute ventilation is much lower than what a new textbook or a new measure of how much do people breathe. So it seems like we have, and maybe it's because of stress or maybe other reasons, we've started to breathe more and more and get that CO2 level in our blood uh, too low. So how does breathing more and more correlate to the CO2 level specifically? Because to me, it would seem like if you're breathing more then you'd be creating more CO2. Can you explain that? A little bit more? No, if you're, you're producing CO2 based on your metabolism, and so there's a certain amount that you pr produce, and it's removed by exhalations, breathing out. So if you're breathing more, you're removing more CO2. So the CO2 goes low. Well, the thing about CO2 being low, that they teach us like in day one of physiology, when, when you're in medical school, is that the CO2 level has an effect on the oxygen binding to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is that protein that carries our oxygen. And if CO2 is low, the hemoglobin and oxygen stick together really tight. And so that you may have a lot of oxygen on your hemoglobin, but you don't release it. And so that was the key that Bottega found is that we actually have less oxygen if we breathe too much 
because of what's called the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which talks about how easily oxygen releases from hemoglobin. So this tendency that our populations have to breathe more and more, whether it's stress, I think stress is, is one of the things in our indoor hectic lifestyle. Uh, the more we breathe, then the lower our CO2 gets, the less oxygen we deliver to our tissues. Well, and as we've talked about in other videos too, our breathing and the amount we breathe has to do with our stress response. When we're breathing quickly, typically that's indicating that we're stressed out. Whereas if we can slow our breathing down, we go into a more relaxed state, slower brain waves. So that might have something to do with it as well. Now to take a step back, you mentioned that CO2 is considered a waste product. And I remember when in, when in school learning that CO2 is also a waste product. Where did that whole paradigm start where CO2 is bad for us? Well, CO2, you know, is a product of our metabolism. It is something that we get out of our body. So in a sense, it is a waste product. Uh, but it, it's critically important for the life cycle because the CO2 we breathe out, plants take in. And plants do just the opposite. They take in the CO2 and with photosynthesis, they add uh, water to CO2 to make sugar. So that's kind of uh, how energy is created on the planet. We breathe out CO2, the plants take the CO2 in and their waste product is oxygen. Now, what oxygen does in the human physiology is oxygen is called the terminal electron acceptor. So oxygen accepts the electrons that go along our electronic cable. It's a cable of proteins. That electronic cable makes our energy. That's inside our mitochondria, our little engines. Got it. So CO2 is a waste product in that we expel it, but it's also important to have CO2 within our blood, it sounds like. So let's talk about how do we keep more CO2 within us? This is where the breathing, uh, using a, a unique technique that you came across. Can you explain what this breathing technique is and how this correlates to keeping more CO2 within the body? The... Uh... The idea is just to breathe less. So, you know, that makes no sense. That goes against kind of what everybody says. Oh, deep breathe, deep breathe, you know, be, do deep breathing. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with breathing deeply. But if you over breathe, you're going to have a, a low CO2. And that isn't good because you're not going to release oxygen to your tissues. So oxygen, you know, is part of what creates our energy. So you have low energy if you're breathing too much. So the basic idea is to breathe less. Now to get to specific things in our lives that kind of affect this, well, one, one place that we over breathe is really common to over breathe, especially if you sleep on your back is during sleep. So one of the first things that I recommend doing as an intervention to bring your CO2 levels up. I measure CO2 levels in my patients and health coaching clients. If they have a, done a regular chemistry panel, it'll often have the CO2. So you can look at your CO2 and you can look at the normal range. And if you're up at the, at the higher end of the normal range, you know, you normally think, well, that's a toxin. Being at the high end of the normal range is bad, but no, having a CO2 up at the higher end of the normal range is a sign of good health. So that's one of the markers that we use in our health coaching clients to kind of get an idea of how bad are things. But getting back to sleep, that's a time, especially if you sleep on your back, especially if you mouth breathe, your CO2 will be low uh, all during sleep. So the first thing we have people do is take paper tape, the 3M micropore tape, or some other tape that doesn't rip your skin off and tape your mouth closed. Now that might be difficult at first, you might not make it through the whole night, but that is kind of step one 
of how to correct your breathing. Uh, the other is to breathe less, to, to focus on breathing less and maybe even holding your breath. Holding your breath builds up your CO2. And what we have is we have sensors that sense our oxygen levels, sense our CO2 levels. And these sensors, they, they, they monitor the amount of, of CO2 in our blood and they send a message to our brain. So our brain kind of gets reset. If we're chronically over breathing, then our sensor will reset to that lower CO2 level. And what holding your breath does, we're consciously under breathing, like Bateko, the Russian scientist that I talked about before, he would have his patients focus on uh, air hunger, like for 10 minutes, breathe to where you feel you're not breathing enough. And that brings up your CO2 level. Holding your breath does the same thing. So what you do, if you do that every day, kind of as a, an exercise, then you can reset your CO2 sensor back to where it normally should be. Because all of us, because of over-breathing, we've reset our CO2 sensors to an abnormally low level, which stimulates, it's kind of a vicious cycle. You know, we have the, the respiration gets triggered because we now have this very low CO2 level that our body wants, but it isn't the optimal CO2 level for us. So the Bateko methods, under breathing, holding your breath, and taping your mouth closed at night are, are very effective at gradually over weeks and months, bringing your CO2 levels up, and then you start to notice the benefit. So is this, is this uh, breathing exercise similar to the Ujjayi breath in yoga, the, the breath that the yoga instructors and yoga practice recommends? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know specifically what that, that is, but typically the breathing in yoga is to breathe uh, five or six respirations a minute, whereas the normal American breathes 12. So yeah, the yoga breathing where you only breathe, you're breathing way slower. Well, it's also a breath that you only do through your nose. So you're not breathing through your mouth. So yes, and that, that was another one of Bateko's tenets was to 100% of the time breathe only through your nose. So that's the taping the mouth shut so you don't do it when you're unconscious sleeping, you know, revert back to mouth breathing. And then when you're awake, just saying, you know, I don't, don't breathe through my mouth. Now, this has many benefits. Breathing through the mouth can uh, predispose you to gingivitis because there are aerobic bacteria in our mouth. Our mouth is meant to be closed. And if you don't let oxygen in there, and you know, when you're talking a lot, they get in there, but when you don't let the oxygen in, it doesn't let those bacteria multiply. So keeping your mouth shut and breathing only through your nose. Your nose humidifies air, so you need to drink less water. You, you become less dehydrated. If you nasal breathe, our nose filters. So it filters bacteria, viruses, pollen, uh, heats up the air. So the nose is where we're meant to breathe from. It has many health benefits just breathing through your nose, you know, besides thinking about oxygen or, or carbon dioxide. So why is it, do you think that we've kind of grown up thinking that breathing through the mouth is a normal thing? Whereas you're right about the nose being able to kind of filter the air that we're breathing. Why do so many of us actually breathe through the mouth? Yeah, I think it's just a, a cultural thing, you know, we're, we think more is better for so many things. And so we think, well, more air is better that the oral airway is much bigger than the nasal airway. So if you want to breathe more air, and yes, if you're a competitive athlete and you're going at your maximum uh, ability of your muscles and heart 
to work on the oxygen, then you need to breathe through your mouth. If you're to, to go as fast as you can possibly go, you need to breathe through your mouth to do that. But you know, an everyday person like me, or most of the people out there, you don't really ever have to resort to mouth breathing because you're not, you know, competing against anybody. You, if you starve your muscles for oxygen by just breathing through your nose and not letting, you know, they'll they'll ache more and you'll get just as good of a workout going at less intensity because you're governing how much oxygen is coming in. And you may know of these new exercise programs where you inflate uh, like a cuff over your muscles or your thighs and your biceps so that they don't get blood. And then you exercise so they get sore really fast because they're not getting any blood flow. And they find that actually improves your fitness without having to work as hard by inflating coughs over your thighs and your arms when you're exercising. So that's just another way to kind of uh, you know, reduce this oxygen level uh, uh, with exercise. It's kind of a new craze taking off. Now, I haven't ever done that or evaluated it. Actually, that was uh, being done for the astronauts. There's a system for the astronauts called VASPR. So VASPR used cold thermogenesis. So you had this cooling unit in the exercise machine and you had the cuffs that pumped up. So your legs, it's like exercise bike. So your and arm thing and your legs and arms weren't getting blood because of cuffs on them. And uh, it was a great way for the astronauts to improve their fitness, they could do a very short workout with the cooling and the reduced blood flow. It was like working out three hours, just doing a 20 minute session. Yeah, we'll do a video on that too, um, on, that, on that new workout craze. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll do one of those soon, I promise. So in terms of uh, steps that people need to take in order to incorporate this breathing technique, so we recommend putting that tape over your mouth when you sleep. That can start getting your body used to breathing through your nose. As an overall kind of thought process, it's, it's breathing less and breathing slower. The cool benefit of thinking and, and becoming conscious of your breathing is it also reduces stress. So when you focus on slowing your breathing down, you'll notice your body starting to relax and you'll leave that stress response state. So that's a great thing to do on a daily basis. And you can incorporate these breathing techniques into your meditation or into your yoga. As I mentioned before, the Ujjayi breath is a sealed lip breath. So that's very similar to what we're talking about here. What else should people do in terms of steps? Well, I think a good resource, there, there's a book uh, called The Oxygen Advantage. And so it, it like what, what this breathing system has shown that people can overcome asthma, uh, people can uh, overcome sleep apnea, like have severe sleep apnea, and it completely goes away with doing these protocols. Uh, and so this book outlines that. Uh, the same thing with asthma, it, it can cure your asthma, just learning nasal breathing. And then going further is exercising where you're only doing nasal breathing. And then to push it even further, holding your breath while exercising. So in other words, go as long as you can. And you, I wouldn't start this way, but go as long as you can holding your breath. So this builds that tolerance to CO2 that resets that set point in your brain of where your body senses the CO2 should be. When you have a higher CO2, remember patients that have a higher CO2s are healthier. The athletes, the, the really uh, in, in the prime peak performance athletes have a higher CO2 level. And that's what Bateko discovered. And then he found when he took sick people and he did these protocols, and made their CO2s higher, 
their medical conditions improve. So it's something that is kind of a broad spectrum way to treat medical conditions by getting more of that life-giving oxygen to the cells where it's needed and not necessarily just moving a bunch of air through your lungs. And as Howard mentioned, slowing down your breathing stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and recovery part of our nervous system that in most modern people in the Western world, that system's kind of shut down. And so we need a lot of different strategies to try to turn that back on. So definitely start incorporating this breathing protocol and let us know how you do. We'd, we'd love to hear your story to see if this is benefiting you. With our health coaching clients, this is one of the this is one of the areas that I say they're struggling the most because this is largely unknown. And as my dad mentioned, all sorts of health conditions can be improved just through this one technique alone. So go try it out and we will see you guys on the next video. Thanks.